Welcome to the Black Sparrow Media Internet Broadcast Network. Listening to Linux in the Hamshack. LHS is a podcast about Linux, open source, and amateur radio for everyone. Now, here are your hosts Russ, K5TUX, Cheryl, W5MOO, and Bill, NE4RD. Well, hello everybody and welcome. You have tuned in to episode number 469 of Linux in the Hamshack, the most terrific amateur radio podcast on the internet. And tonight we are doing our short topics episode because we cheaped out and talked about Hamvention on our deep dive, but <laughs> it's okay. It's a, it's a thing that we do sometimes. It's only once a year, so stay tuned for the next deep dive. It'll be... Much more interesting, but interestingly enough, our first topic is going to be about Hamvention, but it's going to be a short topic, so <laughs> don't worry about that. But before we dive into it, let's go ahead and introduce ourselves. I'm Ross K5TUX. I'm Cheryl W5MOO. And I'm Bill NE4RD. Who, for a change, is not delayed. Excellent. Hey, how about that? That's amazing. <laughs> it's, it's incredible. But we shouldn't delay... Because if we do delay, then Bill will get delayed. So let's go ahead and dive right into it. And we're going to go ahead and let Cheryl read our first topic. We have a lead topic. And guess what? I've already let the cat out of the bag. So what do we got? Well, the lead topic is the 2022 Hamvention attendance has been announced. And it reads that the official attendance at Hamvention 2022 was 31,367. General Chairman Rick Allnett, WS8G, said that although about a thousand less, that it was about a thousand less in 2019, he considered it not bad for a pandemic recovery year. Of course, Hamvention was canceled in 2020 and 2021 because of the COVID pandemic. Yes, yes, as we're all aware. And everybody who went to Hamvention had a good time. We all attended our local super spreader or something. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> got the got the COVID spread around good. Yep. Had to make sure we weren't uh, keeping that bottled up anymore. So have we determined that the 31,367 is actual attendance and not ticket sales? Well, they say it's attendance, but uh, I have my doubts. I, I think it's probably ticket sales. Based on our experience, I'm going to say it was probably ticket sales because <laughs> I don't think there were that many people. It, I mean, the fairgrounds is pretty good size, but if you if you take 32,000 people and stuff them anywhere near there, um, you're going to know it. <laughs> well, so. and the thing is, if it was ticket sales, assuming people were buying multiple tickets because of the dream prize or whatever it was. That was be, that was being given away. You know, it wouldn't shock me that people were buying two, three, four, five tickets in hopes of winning that. So yeah, I'm I'm quite sure. In fact, that was the reason I bothered to buy a ticket, which I don't know why I do because I never win anything. But <laughs> there was a chance. You never. Know. I mean, yes, it's one chance in thirty one thousand three hundred and sixty seven for sure. So that's pretty so, good. Yeah, I mean, better than lottery odds, you know. Yeah, yeah, way better than lottery odds. That's that's for sure. So, yeah, Don says there couldn't have been that many people because there were no lines for the bathroom, and that's true. I actually, there was one time I did have to go, and there there was a small line, but I didn't have to wait more than like four minutes. So yeah, yeah, for sure. And the thing is, there was there were uh, portaloos right outside of Building Five, which I don't remember there being in past yeah i don't recall them being there last time either but that was that was convenient <laughs> it, it was convenient and i just wonder if the reason there were no lines for the bathrooms is because there were more bathrooms could be maybe yeah well whatever the reason that's always a good thing <laughs> 
Uh, I will I will attest to the fact that, and Bill can attest to the fact that since he likes to be, drink beer while he's at the booth, that uh, having a porta potty handy is always good. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, quick quick little stop out. <laughs> they were they weren't heavily used either, so they were pretty clean most of the weekend. So right, yeah, because you could like run out the side door, go down there, and then come back in the uh, what is that the west door, I guess. Uh, yeah, so yeah, it was uh, it was pretty good. But uh, yeah, thirty-one, three sixty-seven. I don't know. We'll we'll take that with a grain of salt and call it good because uh, I I think our attendance, our uh, participation at our booth was uh, certainly down. But you know, there's always next year. So, all right, moving on. Let's get into our amateur radio topics, and we'll let Bill handle the first one here. <laughs> I thought you would. <laughs> yeah, you you know I'm going to let you do the ones that you. Cut and paste. <laughs> Cut and paste. <laughs> yeah, I happen to run across this one, and uh, apparently uh, this is an upcoming event. Uh, this is Meme Appreciation Month. Uh, Meme Appreciation Month is an event organized by a bunch of lids. <laughs> as okay, this is this is uh, strike through, but we'll read them all uh, as an excuse to put ridiculous call signs on the air or a, a celebration of funny internet pictures your parents don't understand during the period from June twenty fifth to August fifth, twenty twenty two. Who asked? Well, we don't know. Uh, during the course of the event, the following call signs will be active on the air. Uh, VB4 Ligma, L-I-G-M-A. VB3 Yeet, <laughs> Yankee Echo Echo Tango. Uh, Victor Charlie 9, uh, Cat Girl. <laughs> K3K, VB6 Dank, uh, Vic, uh, VC3 Rick Roll, and let's see, VB3 Harambee. <laughs> <laughs> the actual operators of these calls may oh, will uh, rotate through throughout the event in order to get the most out of their money cries the $60 event call sign fees that's in parentheses uh, missing out on the lols move closer to Canada no they say try APRS for the duration of the event VB3 Yeet will be active autonomously on APRS listening for messages from near and far both on uh, 144.39 and APRSIS, which I believe is an eye gate. So, uh, so yeah, you should be able to should be able to get on there. So they say join the madness and uh, check out the uh, the link to the blog post over there on uh, the VA3ZZA blog and uh, find all the funniness that is to come in the next few weeks here. Um, what what about the K3K one? That's that's not a Canadian call sign. Yeah, I know that's an American one. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> I have and, no idea what that one's for. You know, K, okay, K, okay, I don't know. I, I don't know what any of those are for. I mean, yeah. the, the Rick Roll one, yes, I get that one, but. You no, know, they're just all memes, you know, dank. Yeah, d but what's Ligma? I have no idea. Yeah, I'm not sure on that one either. V Ligma, V B4, B, I, I have no idea. I don't know what any of these things are. My, my, uh, meme foo is apparently weak. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pop culture dictionary. Let's see. Let's see. It's a, Ligma is a made up disease, an internet hoax to claim to have killed popular Fortnite video game streamer Ninja. So there you go. Uh, okay. Well, <laughs> you know what? Now that I've heard the words, I still don't understand what it is. Yeah. <laughs> it's not worth the price of admission on that uh, exactly. Google search. <laughs> I might look for the one that's on uh, APRS. Uh, which one was that one? The VB3 Yeet? Yeet. Yeah. Yes. That, that should be. Since I've now set up my own eye gate. I can uh, I can get to that one. <laughs> All right. So moving on, we have another story: the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. I keep hearing about this thing. Isn't it over already? <laughs> <laughs> I think it starts like uh, the, this coming week is the the bank holiday week. Yeah, there's been more more build up to this than World War Two. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> All right. So anyway. The Queen's Platinum Jubilee special event will be on the air. RSGB special, special, special event stations. Is it supposed to be double special like that? <laughs> Just put the copy in there. <laughs> All right. So cut and paste. Here we go. Are being activated from the four UK home nations and three crown dependencies. The call signs are GB70E. I believe that's a zero. Yeah. It's GB70E because it's the 70th. 70th. Yes. Yeah. Right. And then GB70M for Scotland, GB70W for Wales, and GB70I for Northern Ireland, and GB70J for Jersey, GB70U for Guernsey. And what? They couldn't do G for Guernsey? Okay. <laughs> what? It, <laughs> Apparently not. Apparently not. And GB70D. For the Isle of Man. Well, these call signs are all over the place. Anyway, 
The UK regulator Ofcom has licensed a series of special call signs that will be active only during June 2022, including from 2nd to the 5th of June 2022, which is the Queen's Platinum Jubilee Bank holiday weekend in the UK. And that, of course, came from the RSGB. And the link will be available in the show notes if you want to check out more about that. Man, they're really talking this up. <laughs> so... <laughs> So look for those GB70 calls. They're, they'll be out there, at least from the 2nd to the 5th. So, so much for our not doing time-sensitive information. It's the whole month. It's the whole well, month that's yeah, going to be active. So I figured if it's a month-long event, that's probably good enough to include in here. Plus, there was a severe lack of amateur radio news that was worth sharing. So <laughs> that's what you get. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. All right, so let's move back to Bill in our open source topics for tonight, and we'll let him talk about the latest release of Pulse Audio, which, what, didn't they just drop this in favor of Pipewire? Isn't Pipewire, like, 100% solid and works for everybody? Well, you know, the the server doesn't run much anymore, but, you know. <laughs> uh, definitely the shim is, uh, is there, but, uh, yeah, Pulse Audio 16 is released Notes for end users. So yeah, some uh, some good improvements here. Open support uh, in the RTP modules, uh, stereo output to support for uh, some special devices like the uh, GSP670 USB wireless headset series. Uh, let's see, we have uh, Bluetooth device battery level uh, reporting added. So finally, you can you can see the battery level of your you know your headphones before they go out. Uh, let's see, module loopback improvements. That's probably a good thing. Uh, anything else here worth? bothering let's see some application notes for developers uh we got uh, stream latency reports now include resampler delay so hey might fix my delay issue no just kidding uh bluetooth device oh i just moved my whole screen how about that <laughs> bluetooth uh device battery level oh yeah we already talked about that one and let's see uh blah 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 blah. open support yeah so yeah all in all it's a it's a 16.0 release so it's a dot zero release so uh don't expect to see it in your builds anytime soon um, but, uh, yeah, it's out there. So, uh, it's, uh, check out the link to the, uh, release notes in the show notes. All right. Very good. So yeah, Pulse Audio is still a thing. Just like, just like, uh, System D. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We had a, a lengthy conversation with a, an attendee at Hamvention about System D. So <laughs> yeah. We told him to go ghost BSD, right? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yep. Because <clears throat> he wanted to switch to BSD and did not like System D, and we told him that there were distributions that didn't use System D. They were still on Sys5 for for folks like him, who who were not a fan of System D. Uh, lots of ways to get around it, and I I found myself actually kind of defending System D, which is weird because I remember uh, many times on this show uh, being in his position <laughs> and eventually coming around to to System D. I still don't. I still don't particularly like the complexity of the unit files. You you can build a unit file very simply, but if you want to do anything with any kind of, you know, um, special specialness or creativity, it, it can uh, be very complex and you can get into a rabbit hole very quickly. But uh, it works and, uh, you know, the system control utility is, is pretty useful and you can also shim in system five init scripts into system D. So, you know, it's kind of like all these other things where people don't want to migrate. So they're shimming in all the, all the old crap. <laughs> so maybe we should do a, a deep dive on system D. No, yeah, that, <laughs> that'd be like 40 minutes of suck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Let's, uh, let's move on from that and talk a little bit about DistroBox. Version 1.3 has been released and wow, my thing just sort of scrolled down. So here we go. A new version of DistroBox was released today, uh, today, whenever today was. The open source system that allows quickly and easily launching different distributions from your terminal via Podman or Docker. DistroBox has been a popular option for augmenting the package selection and versions available on your system, or as well for firing up faster versions of software. DistroBox is self-described as, quote, use any Linux distribution inside your terminal. Enable both backward and forward compatibility with software and freedom to use whatever distribution you're more comfortable with. DistroBox uses Podman or Docker to create containers using the Linux distribution of your choice. The created container will be tightly integrated with the host, allowing sharing of your home directory of the user, external storage, external USB devices, and graphical apps in X11 or Wayland. Wayland, I'm going to strike that through. 
<laughs> uh, and audio. So there you go. If you want to check out DistroBox, I'm I'm going to go ahead and check that out because I didn't know anything about it until just now. So yeah, I'd, I'd heard about it, but I I didn't I didn't know this much about it. But yeah, it looks like an easy way to uh, to uh, isolate some apps that maybe there aren't builds for. Even though I mean, technically, you can compile your app to work, <laughs> but, right? But maybe maybe your app, like so, you know, like your special app, like uh, uh, Etherpad, right, needs a special distribution <laughs> to run. <laughs> yep. This could be an alternative. <laughs> that, that might be the way to go, since I'm having issues with trying to get it to run in Docker straight away. So I might give that a shot and see how it works. So a distro inside a terminal window, it sounds a little bit like WSL because that's kind of yeah. what WSL looks like. So Very similar. All right. Very good. So let's see if we can uh, bring Cheryl in here to read one more, unless she's uh, got caught up in the face bag. <laughs> not, not in the face bag. So. Well, I, I'm sorry. You know, you, you have a – you're often in Facebook, so – I I've, I've been working on a business thing, so okay, you're gonna, you're gonna have to tell me where I'm at because I've been busy. Oh, so. you're in the last story of the open source. Well, yeah, last story of open source. Okay, so I scanned. It's it. called okay. the Linux Foundation Security Mobilization, Mobilization Plan. Plan. Okay, yeah. <laughs> just want to make Got sure it. you're at the right <laughs> place. I had to scan down. Thank you. And, and I actually, I actually curated this cut and paste, so it should read fine. Wow. Well, see, I, I do the extra work. Yeah, I know. <laughs> That's the reason why Bill gets to read the own stuff that people don't go in and correct. That's right. Yeah. So. All right. Okay. So. Now, now on to my story. So the next one is Linux Foundation Security Mobilization Plan, as Russ just said. And the information is the Linux Foundation has posted a quote unquote open source software security mobilization plan that aims to address a number of perceived security problems with the expenditure of nearly 140 million over two years. While there are considerable ongoing efforts to secure the OSS supply chain to achieve acceptable levels of resilience and risk, a more comprehensive series of investments to shift security from a largely reactive exercise to a proactive approach is required. Our objective is to evolve the systems and processes used to ensure a higher degree of security assurance and trust in the OSS supply chain. This paper suggests a comprehensive portfolio of 10 initiatives which can start immediately to address three fundamental goals for hardening the software supply chain. Vulnerabilities and weaknesses in widely deployed software present systemic threats to the security and stability of modern society as a government service, infrastructure providers, nonprofits, and the vast majority of private businesses rely on software in order to function. Did I skip over something? No. Okay. I don't know. It seemed that seemed to not read right, but that's, <laughs> that's, okay. that's I think, taken. I think as you went government from the service instead of services, so you kind of. You yeah, broke, got, got you, it, broke got the, it. you broke the ordered list. A little I bit. broke it. Yeah. So. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that was it. So that that came from the Open Software Security Foundation. I guess that's what OpenSSF.org, a branch of Linux Foundation, and the link to the entire plan is in the show notes. So if you want to read the whole thing, you can. It's uh, many pages of stuff. So, <laughs> um, it sounds like it could be interesting. They they do have a good focus on security, and it is probably well worth the read if you have the time. So moving on from there, we're down into the Linux in the Hamshack segment, and I'll go ahead and take the first one here. This is pot, ports down, not, uh, not pots down, ports down for digital tr TV transmit. What the? <clears throat> I think that's supposed to be transmitter. Okay. So let me start again. Ports down for digital TV transmitter. Dave Crump, Golf 8, Golf Kilo, Quebec, because, wow, that's a call sign, has a passion for amateur TV. Starting with analog home-built equipment, his projects have raised him up to be a key player in the British Amateur Television Club. His latest project, Ports Down 4, brings the new world of digital television transmission to a wider audience than ever before. And this is quoting from the article. 
I was inspired by the desire to reproduce a capability that a few years ago would have been or would have occupied half a room and cost hundreds of thousands of pounds and replace it with something cheap and portable that could be used by myself and my fellow amateur TV enthusiasts, Dave tells us. Fellow enthusiasts had been discouraged by the seeming complexity of digital TV broadcasting. It was assumed to be out of the reach of the home enthusiast, but the advent of Raspberry Pi changed all that. And back to quoting again, Raspberry Pi brought two key elements to the project at the beginning. The first was hardware H.264 encoding. Radio amateurs are limited in the amount of bandwidth and power that they can use for communication. The second was easy image capture using the camera, which works seamlessly with the H.264 encoder. And there's a lot more in the Magpie magazine, which is a magazine dedicated to Raspberry Pi. And this article was, uh, I think it was like three pages long in Magpie. And a link, of course, will be in the show notes. And it goes into all the details about doing digital amateur TV broadcasting user using a Raspberry Pi. So if you are into that thing or want to check out what that's all about, you can go ahead and check out the article. And uh, if you're already a subscriber of the Magpie magazine, you've, you've already read this, but I didn't even know Magpie existed until I saw the story. And it, it's a really cool magazine. It's a digital magazine, but it's uh, it's got a great format and it's like well produced, lots of uh, color images and and in depth articles and stuff like that. So it might be something worth checking out. All right, and then Bill's got another giant cut and paste here, so we're gonna let him. <laughs> Yeah, Tell you about the latest your... release of uh, WFU, and then I have a comment about WFU. Sure. Yeah, this is a WFU 1.2 Echo is released. Uh, Roland Jansen, uh, PA3MET, announced over on the uh, Linux ham mailing list, said, we're pleased to announce the WFU 1.2E. Not many changes to the UI functionality, but a large internal ones. Uh, low latency audio and more stable. Planning is to have the next version support UI additions and changes. Here are the following highlights that are in this uh, uh, 1.echo, 1.2.echo release. <laughs> That's the two there. Anyway, many changes, mods, updates, enhancements to Rig Control D. Rig Control D box added in the UI. Uh, build process has changed, so you can uh, add the install prefix. Uh, we said, let's see, let's just kind of screw, go down here real quick. Uh, basic split support in Rig Control. I know I saw something here with WK5TUX on it. Oh, yeah. Adjusted window size for radios without spectrum. Thanks, K5TUX. Hey, look, you got a, got a shout out. <laughs> <laughs> added the clock and UTC toggle. Uh, so you got forced, added a forced manual RTS setting. Uh, added a box to include a Patreon site. Oh, we got adware in it now. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, allow dynamic restarting of server. New settings tab. Enable high t- DPI scaling. Oh, that'll be good because like I noticed that it was flaking a little bit when uh when i was flipping back and forth between high dpi and not and more multi-radio support mostly working in uh, parentheses uh split land waterfall data for n1 mm plus spectrum scope support and many 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 more so you can check out the link to the mailing list and that's the linux ham mailing list and if you're not a member of that just you should just go ahead and join uh lots of good information kind of comes through there a lot of discussions on uh software and plus you know a lot of our audience can answer a lot of questions that come up in the uh in the mailing list and give some feedback so uh there you go yeah wfu 1.2e what do you have to say about it well i'm gonna have to check this against whatever version of wfu i'm currently running because i was in the middle of setting up a proof of concept aprs digipeter an i gate and i was going to i'm eventually going to try and move this to like a pie with an mmdvm hat or something like that so i don't have to like use up a radio to to set up an eye gate but in the meantime i was doing it with my ic7100 using dire wolf and the well i've i've did it, i've done it with both disaster and um yak yaac yet another aprs client and they, it works fine. However, when I first set it up, I was using WFU to be the rig control daemon because it has that functionality built in. And since I was operating using an ICOM radio, I thought it might be nice to use ICOMs or not ICOMs, but WFU's rig control D, uh, to be the thing that did the PTT for my radio. But in doing so, it had a problem where every once in a while it would key up and not unkey. There was one time we were coming back from dinner one night, and 
I went to check the status of my APRS beacon on APRS.fi and noticed that I wasn't there and I was kind of curious why I wasn't. And then I looked on my radio and 144390 was solid receive because my eye gate had not unkeyed. <laughs> and it was like that for probably a good 30 minutes. So when I got home, I shut it off and that was fine. And then I started up the regular Hamli rig control demon to do the back end instead of WFU. And it has never had that problem since. So there's some kind of glitch in WFU. And I, like I said, I want to, because there have been updates to the rig control support in the latest version. I need to compare what version I'm running to this uh, 1.2 Echo and see, and I'll probably just get in touch with uh, Elliot and find out, you know, tell him what my problem was and see if this kind of thing has been addressed because that's uh, obviously a problem. Uh, and it doesn't happen with the standard rig control D. So it's it's definitely something in WFU, uh, but I'll check that. It's not like I have to use WFU for rig control D. Uh, I just kind of, Thought it was cool to do that, but I can't have the rig staying keyed up for 30 minutes at a time. <laughs> so yeah, that would be bad. Th that's definitely bad. Uh, luckily, I'm only running it at uh, 15 watts, so it's not like it's going to burn anything up or anything. But it's uh, you know unidentified because it's basically keyed up with no transmission. So, but yeah, I'm going to go ahead and uh, figure out what the issue there was. We'll address it with WFU, and in the meantime, I'm just going to keep it running with my rig control D out of ham live until I get my MMDVM set up or whatever other way I'm going to do this. I can't remember. See, I have, I have like a, a Kenwood uh, mobile rig that I could do this with. It has a six pin thing and I could use like a, like a tiger tronics to do the interface with dire wolf uh, to set up as an eye gate, which I might use that, but I can't remember if I sold it or not. So I'm going to have to go see if I find it. <laughs> But uh, one one way or another, I'm going to get an eye gate set up in a in a permanent way because I, I have noticed that there is a dearth of digipeding in this area, and my my radius actually on the current setup, even at 15 watts with a 20 foot antenna, covers almost all of the county here. So uh, I've been watching like truckers and and other people. Uh, come through, and uh, I've been capturing their beacons for, for almost the entire county. And as far as I can tell, I'm the only, like, more than a watt digipeter anywhere near here. So oh. that's kind of cool. Yeah, that's good. And I picked up that weather balloon the other day, which was really neat. So it was like fir first day on, and all of a sudden I'm seeing, I'm you know, I'm digipeding a weather balloon, <laughs> which was awesome. So, yeah, APRS is, um, who knew? You know, it's kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got to fix my APR stuff. That'll be that'll be my next project. I'll probably talk about that next time. <laughs> all right. Very cool. Well, that's all I had to say about that. So that brings us down to the end of our Linux and Hamshocks topics, which means we're into announcements and feedback. And as far as I know, we don't have any announcements. I certainly don't. Does anyone help us have any announcements other than the Smart Cam Fest, which is coming up next week? No, I don't have anything. All right, so no announcements other than the Smart Hand Fest, which is the Southwest Missouri Amateur Radio Club's Hand Fest. It's going to be on Saturday, June 4th. I will, of course, be there. It's uh, open from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. I am going to be on the hunt for a cell wave um, duplexer, which I'm told there will be at least one of there. And if there is, then I'm going to go ahead and pick one up. Hopefully it's not ridiculously priced. And uh, then I'll be able to get a duplexer. And then I'll have to find somebody who can help me tune it. But in the meantime, we'll just see if we can find one first. So that's all I've got for that. And then we're down to new subscribers, supporters, and live participants. We did pick up a few, uh, presumably from Hamvention and maybe from other places. And hopefully we'll pick up some more as time goes on, uh, as people actually pull their their little tchotchkes and business cards out from all the swag they got at Hamvention. And uh, we'll go ahead and let Cheryl tell us who uh, all these new folks are. Okay, so to start our list are subscribers and Patreons. And we have Stacy KB7YS, and High Chance. On Facebook, we had Jacob Black, Brian Chen, Patrick McGeehan, Leonard Carter Hutchinson, Michael Fritch, Donald Watkins, Chris Locke, and Colin Hall. 
On Twitter, we had at Case Zero LWC and at John Moo 8573 On YouTube, we had LU1 EKK Fran Salazar, IK04, Mike Long, uh, SPM Bucket One, and James 1949. On Discord, we had Procyon. NPE and Robin. And on the live chat, we had Don KC9ZMY, Steve KA7HVT, and Ted WA0EIR. Yep. So thanks to everybody who listened to us live tonight. We really appreciate that. And of course, thank you to all the folks who came on board, whether or not it was due to Hamvention. And if we did meet you at Hamvention, it was good to see you there. And we're glad you stopped by and uh, joined our social media roundup. And uh, we also want to thank our paid supporters, whether it be a PayPal or Patreon. And, of course, everybody who goes ahead and downloads the show and listens to us. And uh, especially if you are the kind of person who shares with your friends or your club or just out on the interwebs, we appreciate all the shares uh, because word of mouth is pretty much all the advertising we do. So we really appreciate it. And with that, we have come down to the end of the show. So we'll go ahead and wrap this one up and let you go ahead and get along with the rest of your day and the rest of your week. We hope you have a good one. This has been episode number 469 of Linux in the Ham Shack. I'm Russ, K5TUX. I'm Cheryl, W5MOO. And I'm Bill, NE4RD, 73. Thank you for listening to this episode of Linux in the Hamshack. LHS is a community-sponsored podcast. Our website is located at lhspodcast.info. You can support the podcast by visiting the LHS Patreon page at patreon.com stroke LHS podcast or by using the contribute list on the homepage. We have a presence on Discord, Facebook, IRC, Twitter and YouTube. You can also drop us an email at info at lhspodcast.info or leave us a voicemail at 1-909-LHS-SHOW. That's 1-909-547-7469. Visit the online LHS merchandise store at shop.lhspodcast.info for fun and fashionable show-themed merchandise. Until next time, remember to always heed your hedonism.